think we can get started. Thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Damien Real. I'm a yeah. tech lawyer, turn, a coder turned lawyer turned software developer turned cybersecurity guy. And I'm going to be talking about uh, top 10 tech law developments. Uh, for those who have been in my session before, I talk really fast, and there's a lot of things to be able to talk about here. Um, so you can think about this as I, I'm doing this rapid fire. I used to have a Tommy gun on this, but then uh, this is maybe more in, in line with the times. Um, if you don't like a particular thing, uh, wait about 60 seconds, it's going to go away. Uh, it may be even less than that. Uh, so there are lots of written materials. So my uh, hashtag, uh, my twi Twitter handle is on the bottom right. To the extent you want the written materials, please let me know and I'll send them to you. First uh, up of the 10 is privacy. That's a big deal uh, at any time. And the Supreme Court uh, pulled up privacy this last year. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts talked about geolocation. Uh, so anyone who has a cell phone might be interested. That uh, they're, they're The question came before the Supreme Court is, to what extent does the police have to have a warrant to be able to find out where you are and what you're doing and what you're, uh, where your cell phone is? And uh, the Supreme Court, thankfully, at least from my perspective, said you need to have a warrant be able, before you're able to find geolocation or other things with your cell phone, because otherwise you could effectively tail anybody without a warrant, um, and that would be far more invasive than any other surveillance that we've ever had in our history. So thankfully, John Roberts, uh, with the majority, said that uh, only the few without cell phones would be able to es escape it. So, and who does not have a cell phone these days? So anyway, a good decision, in my opinion, from the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court also talked about uh, Google, uh, and there was a privacy uh, litigation against Google, saying that Google allegedly violated privacy. Uh, Google settled the privacy lawsuit in what's called a Cypre settlement. Uh, the, the, what that is, a, it's a legalese term for uh, they're giving uh, a certain number of money. If, if everyone, every one of Google's users were to get part of that class action, uh, each person would get about four cents. Uh, for, for that. Uh, so because of, because of that, the Ninth Circuit, so there's a district court in California and then they appealed to the Ninth Circuit. The appellate court said, you know, it's stupid to you know, send out, spend 30 cents to pay 4 cents. Uh, so we're going to create what's called a side prey settlement where we're donated to a nonprofit or something like that in lieu of that. So the question for the, the Supreme Court is whether the Ninth Circuit decision is right. And the uh, Supreme Court punted back and said uh, they kind of used a, a legal these things to say whether they have standing to sue or not to sue. Uh, they said, go back to Ninth Circuit and look again. Uh, so we're still going to find out whether you're going to get your four cents from Google or not. Uh, another interesting case is Microsoft was sued. Um, and the, part of the discovery uh, lawsuit, what they were asking about whether to what extent do uh, do a US company, Microsoft, need to disclose data from foreign data centers? So in this case, it was Ireland. So to what extent my, Microsoft got sued? To what extent do they need to disclose the information from Ireland? And of course, Ireland's part of the EU, or at least part of it is. Uh, and, the, and the question is, uh, to what extent do they need to do it? Um, the US Supreme Court uh, dismissed it after Congress actually passed a law while the Supreme Court case was pending, saying, yeah, you actually, if you're based in the US, you need to disclose worldwide, not just in the US. So it's a moot, moot point. And the act, the Congressional Act, it's surprising that Congress actually passed something, but they did, saying that uh, providers shall disclose, a US-based provider shall disclose anything outside of the US or inside. Biometrics is a big deal in, uh, in privacy these days. Uh, there's uh, Flickr photos. Uh, did, who, who had a Flickr account back in the day uh, before they went away? Um, you'll be uh, super happy to know that Flickr is now, uh, IBM has adopted the Flickr data set, which when you paid it steps on the Flickr when you initially did it, you also provided a Creative Commons license. And I love Creative Commons. Anybody who knows Lawrence Lessig, Creative Commons is essentially a way to be able to give to the public domain things that, um, that the public domain can reuse, remix, it's awesome. But when you hit yes, I want to provide to the public, uh, to the Creative Commons, to the public good, IBM said, well, the public good means that's spatial recognition. So now anything you submitted to the Creative Commons, IBM has co-opted and are, is using your photos as part of their face, uh, facial recognition data mapping data set. So uh, I, I looked at, you can use this thing uh, provided by, who, I forget who it is. It's in my, oh, NBC News created this thing, saying if you enter your Flickr username, you can see what's in the IBM data set. So I put my username in there, and it turns out my wife's uh, reunion, one of her reunions, I took photos of uh, her friends, uh, and you could see that none of them was looking at the camera. So now their face is in the facial recognition database. Uh, if you, any of you know those people, don't tell them I submitted their face to <laughs> IBM, so now they're going to be part of this database. So when they're walking down the street, uh, Big Brother is going to be able to see who they are. But you might, if you're interested uh, and you had a Flickr uh, username, you might want to check it out to see what, which of your photos is in the facial recognition database. Uh, courts have generally over the years uh, gone into to what extent does the law enforcement, you get pulled over, to what extent can law enforcement force you to open up your phone? And so generally the rule of thumb is that fingerprints are like DNA, handwriting, and actual keys. So if you get arrested, they say, hey, give me the key to your safe, uh, you have to turn over that key. Give me your DNA sample, you have to give that over. Um, fingerprints are the same thing. It's a biometric device to be able to open up your phone. So generally, 
uh, the courts have said that uh, law enforcement can force you to put your fingerprint on it, but the question is, can they force you to put in your PIN, right? And because the, the Fifth Amendment, for those who uh, remember your civics, Fifth Amendment is you cannot self-incriminate. And so to self-incriminate, you have to testify, right? And you cannot be forced to testify against yourself. The idea goes that if it's a PIN number, that's something in your brain. It's not something you have. So if it's in your brain, you have to testify. I say my, my PIN is one, two, three, four. That's actually testifying against yourself to incriminate yourself. So the courts of general said, fingerprints, you ha do have to show. Uh, PIN, you don't have to self-incriminate. At least that's been the, the idea thus far. Uh, words of the wise, if you get pulled over and you don't want to do your phone, generally most modern operating systems reboot, and then you cannot do the fingerprint. You have to actually do the, the, the number. So um, to the extent you uh, want to uh, either, I'm sure none of you would ever have that problem, but if you have friends that would ever uh, worry about the law, that might be a good way to do it. So there's a, a bunch of cases about this, one of which the federal magistrate ordered the fingerprint of a suspected terrorist, uh, she's a Russian uh, national. Um, closer to here in uh, River City, there was a, in Chaska, uh, the court ordered uh, the defendant say, you will provide a fingerprint or thumb for them as deemed necessary by the Chaska police. And this is kind of where uh, I work with a lot of lawyers and a lot of judges, and I will say that lawyers and judges are generally not the most tech savvy uh, people on the planet. Uh, so this uh, poorly written order, um, the, I, I would argue, that I, I don't know who this judge is, so if anyone knows this judge, don't, don't I say that, but it was a poorly written order that the defendant uh, said, well, which finger do you want? And the police said, well, I want the one that opens it. Uh, and so, <laughs> so could have done that, right? But the argument is that he then opened it, but then his defense lawyer and the appellate court said, hey, listen, that was self-incriminating. That's more like the pin number than the fingerprint because he had to disclose which finger it was. And he said, as deemed necessary. So that's as the defendant deems necessary, arguably testifying against himself and violating the Fifth Amendment. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, or I'm sorry, the Minnesota Supreme Court, uh, said, yeah, nice try. Uh, a, it's a, you, you, spell it, you, you, didn't, you don't get out of jail free because you, you gave him the right finger, uh, not necessarily the one finger that uh, maybe had someone else in the room might get out of Another question is, can the cops use face ID to unlock phones, right? So to, to, I would argue, I, I've not seen any cases on this, but query whether face ID is more like fingerprints or more like uh, knowledge in your brain. Arguably, um, you know, they could just hold the phone up to you and then you're in. Maybe do this? <laughs> Facial recognition retail is, is uh, you know, a lot of, I work with a lot of clients, uh, both in my current job and my previous job in privacy, and really talking about to what extent uh, can we integrate biometrics into our work. And so uh, in retail, they're pulling in this. Cali Burger has said that uh, uh, the goal by the end of last year is to replace credit cards. So you walk up to the thing, facial recognition shows, shows who you are, connects to your account, and then you're able to get your burger and run, run, run around. KFC in China is doing a similar thing where they're saying you can make payments and you can say, okay, I know who this person is, so I know that they like this particular dish. I know how old they are, I know what mood they are, and what gender they are. Are they smiling, are they frowning, that sort of thing. Um, Saks Fifth Avenue is doing a similar thing both with uh, security, right? They see somebody walking in, they say, hey, I've seen that person before, they're a shoplifter, we're gonna send security over to take care of them. And they're also going the other way. They're saying to, uh, to the extent that these are VIPs that spend a lot of money with us, they walk in the door, someone quickly goes and says, can I help you, right? So they're both ends of the security and the customer service, uh, they're doing that. Walmart is uh, filed a patent, interestingly, about for facial recognition to identify unhappy customers. And I would argue that anybody who walks into Walmart <laughs> is probably an unhappy customer. So there's a lot of false positives. If you're doing any machine learning on that, you're gonna wanna be able to make sure the data set is, uh, is in there. Uh, JetBlue and Delta, uh, of course this is a Delta hub, so there's a lot of Delta folks. They're testing, comparing facial scans to passports and that kind of thing. Some of you may have actually been a part of that. Uh, also, in preparation for the Super Bowl, uh, the head of the county sheriff's office uh, had the facial recognition where they wanted to identify people as they were walking into the Super Bowl venue to be able to see if you know, people are coming from all over the country, maybe there are people on the FBI's most wanted list, maybe there are others. Um, so they were uh, using uh, some uh, uh, databases to be able to test facial recognition, not only for the cameras in the uh, stadium, but also there's cameras all over the street, right? So if somebody's walking down the street, you see that they're on the FBI's most wanted list, you can maybe nab them. This is something that in the years coming up to the Super Bowl, they had done. Uh, a cool uh, journalist in the subpoena, uh, or not subpoena, but asked to do the FOIA request to ask for all of the documents related to the facial recognition. One of the documents uh, came from an email saying, um, it was from a Hennepin County Sheriff's Office person saying, you know, this system's so good that I not only identified the person I was looking for, I was doing the close relatives of this person. And it's, it costs a shit ton, but I love it. Uh, so the query whether, you know, there's civil liberties, you know, and there's protecting, the, there's, there's always a balance between civil liberties and protecting the public. And so, um, Query whether uh, where that falls. 
Uh, a bunch of Illinois passed a law called the Biometric uh, Information Privacy Act, and this is uh, the only one I know of the country, at least the most restrictive, saying that you, uh, if you do business in Illinois, you cannot uh, do biometrics. So that's faces, fingerprints, et cetera. And so all the people on the left are getting sued by various people in class actions talking about these privacy violations. And under the Illinois statute, it's between one and $5,000 for each use. So there's over, uh, just over the last year, over 40 putative class actions. Putative class actions, you sue somebody, but you don't actually, uh, a court has to certify that it is a class or it's a BS case that goes away. So these are putative class actions that are sued but haven't yet uh, actually been certified as a class, including one, um, one ca an interesting case where in the last year or so, uh, they said a technical violation of BIP uh, that they're um, using fingerprints maybe to, uh, to be able to sign in employees to work and sign out employees. A uh, technical violation doesn't necessarily show that you're aggrieved. So you as an employee wouldn't necessarily show that you have standing to sue um, under the BIP. Uh, so this is a, something that uh, states around the country are, are looking at to see whether they want to follow an Illinois footsteps or not. Of course, everyone is watching you. Uh, this is interesting that uh, in every one of the carriers here, they, there's somebody who used, uh, um, I would argue, a security vulnerability, a security flaw to be able to say, if you have someone's name plus email plus phone number, plus you fill out this web form, you can find accuracy of where they were within 100 yards within a few hour period. So this is, a, this is something, a vulnerability, thankfully, that has been uh, closed. It was closed shortly before it was actually announced publicly. But um, it shows that vulnerabilities are everywhere. I work for a company where we have pen testers who uh, go through, and uh, it, I, I have worked with, this is, be, this is being recorded, so maybe I have to be careful about what I say, but, um, but they, they can find vulnerabilities anywhere, right? And, and if you find somebody who's intuitive enough, they can find these things. And so just because they close this vulnerability doesn't mean there are others, not others out there. Um, so uh, uh, just another word of the wise that uh, you have to be vigilant about what you turn on and what you turn off, what permissions you give and what you cannot. The CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018, becomes effective this next year, and it's kind of uh, raising a lot of bars. Uh, that, uh, people have heard of GDPR. Um, this is kind of the US version of GDPR. And so the idea is that a lot of companies, when GDPR went into effect in May of 2018, um, they often said, you know, it's so hard to figure out, is this a EU citizen who's been living here in the last 10 years, or are they just traveling over here? Um, it's too hard to figure, parse out who's a, user, who, who's a EU user versus he, who's not a EU user. So I'm just going to make everybody GDPR compliant, right? I'm just not going to worry about it. So C, uh, C, P, CCPA, kind of people I think it might have the same effect. California is requiring it for California citizens, so maybe this is going to be the, the, the standard for the, the whole world, or not the whole world, but the US. Um, the primary, and, and so of course, those who are devs who are working on privacy might be interested to know that under the CCPA, the collection is sharing. Uh, there are categories of specific information, including why are you collecting it, what's the purpose of collection, uh, where are you getting it, what's the source, and who are you sharing it with, right? Is it sh just internally, or are you having partners? Do you have marketing partners? Do you have ad services? So who, uh, where's the data coming from? What, why are you doing it? And where are you, who are you sharing it with are the primary questions? Um, then, as a, what, what is personal data is, of course, uh, who are you, um, who, who is it kind of, who are you implicated with, and who do you describe? Uh, not just you, but the whole household, right? So does it describe my teenage kid, my six-year-old? Um, and then, see, uh, importantly, uh, I as a consumer can opt out of the CPA. Uh, so I can tell my business, hey, I do not want you sharing my information with third parties. Um, and that's opt out for anyone over 16. Anyone under 16, it's, uh, it's, uh, you have to opt in if you're under 16 years old. And of course, there's also the uh, COPA, or COPA, that uh, if you're under 13, uh, you're not supposed to be collecting the data anyway. So really, this should be anyone from 13 to 16 can opt in. Anyone 16 and older can opt out. Uh, I, as a user, can also say, delete my stuff. And the business has to. Um, and also, importantly, if I say, delete my stuff, I should get the same level of service as somebody who keeps their stuff in. So the idea is that I'm not a second class citizen because I decided to opt out. You, as a business, have to provide me with the same amount of service, whether I opt in or opt out of these data sharing packages. <laughs> So a lot of the big question is wh whether the CCPA, um, and, and people who followed this, uh, anybody followed this one and what was going on, but it, it was a big deal because there was one uh, really super rich tele, uh, you know, I, I don't remember what his industry was, Silicon Valley guy that wanted to push this thing through. Um, and so pushed it through uh, really quickly, and now it's kind of the de facto privacy law. And so the, the big question is, will this one guy, literally a guy, um, will this one guy's vision of what is privacy law be the de facto rule of law? And so uh, a lot of Tim Cook and others are saying, well, maybe we need to do a federal side, not a de facto California that becomes everybody, but actually a federal, federal one that uh, officially does everybody to be able to do uh, the US. Much like 
they did in the EU, right? And so there's uh, the GDPA went into, uh, GDPR rather, went into effect in May of this last year. Um, a lot of companies around May 1st are like, oh, that, that's right, that's coming up later, maybe we should start working on that. Um, in July of this last year, there was a, a fine uh, for Facebook where, but this is pre-GDPR, this is before GDPR, uh, actually, uh, this is for actions that happened before GDPR became effective. Equifax, of course, got a, a pre-GDPR activity, but we had our first post-GDPR uh, uh, fine where there was 400,000 pounds for um, this hospital that um, gave social workers and a bunch of hospital users doctor level access. So there were 985 users that had uh, access uh, as a physician, but there were actually only 300 physicians. So the idea is that uh, the GDPR uh, regulators say, hey, that's pretty obvious that you're getting more permissions than you should have been given. So they got a $400,000 fine under the GDPR. There's more to come. Irony, uh, for those guys in the audience, uh, there's a, you know, I, I look for vulnerabilities in software code all the time. Uh, there's a WordPress GDPR compliance plugin that got hacked itself. So that's a, that's a bitter taste. If, if you're a dev for this company, I'm sorry, but that's a, that's a pretty ironic, uh, ironic twist. Uh, after GDPR, there's uh, another regulation that's coming down the pike called e-privacy. So it's like GDPR, but it's actually more restrictive. So uh, to the extent you like GDPR, you'll love e-privacy. Um, any company processing personal data in electronic communications. I don't know if you know any companies that process personal data in electronic communications, but it might be covered. <laughs> this guy has been in the news for a lot of times, including the, what he's revealed uh, with this agency. And so a uh, key provision uh, in the Patriot Act that largely was his work I'm going into it expired uh, in 2017, but it was renewed this last year in 18 and expires again in 2023. And largely the idea is that um, FISA, uh, the US Patriot Act allows uh, the NSA and other three letter agencies to be able to surveil uh, foreign uh, adversaries. And of course, uh, domestic adversaries can communicate with uh, foreign adversaries. So there's a, a big question as to to what extent that foreign adversarial surveillance can sweep up domestic people. Uh, so there's a Big question that, that got renewed again for another four years or so. And I uh, query whether it's going to uh, sunset or whether it will keep getting renewed. As part of the USA Patriot Act, they have uh, national security letters, which are NSL, which is largely if, uh, if the three-letter agency sends your company something saying, um, give us the data for this Twitter user, for example. And the company has to turn over the data. Not only do they have to turn over the data, but that Twitter cannot tell that user, for obvious reasons, hey, uh, we just gave your information to the government. Right? So that's something they can't do. Similarly, they cannot tell the world that, hey, I just gave uh, the NSA one, uh, le one person's uh, information. Nor can they say, I just gave the people uh, 900 people's information. So uh, under the law, you can, uh, you can disclose um, zero, or you can disclose 1,000 or more, uh, but you can't do anywhere in between. So Twitter sued, saying, hey, we want to be able to tell more. We want to be able to tell our users how, how many of these things we've given out. So, um, the court said there's a lot of First Amendment answers. You know, Twitter's First Amendment ability to be able to speak what is true uh, is, uh, has to be balanced with security implications. So under the new, uh, new uh, agreement, uh, not agreement, the new court order, the court said Twitter can, in fact, give the number of uh, NS uh, NSLs that they receive. Uh, so they said that you know, the total number of NSLs that they've been able to publish since 2010, for the last eight years or so, is uh, about 15. So um, if you, uh, number of Twitter users, 15, the odds of your uh, data being swept up in those 15 are pretty slim. Uh, but that's something that Twitter wanted to know in the court order uh, decided that they could. Uh, those who uh, like re not breach notification laws, uh, South Dakota was the 49th state to say that you do have to notify uh, users if their data was breached. Uh, it's uh, second to last in the nation, but at least we're there. And, uh, I think Georgia was finally the last one to have breach notification. So now all 50 states have breach notification laws. Google has a right to be forgotten, uh, at least for the EU. The EU passed a law that requires Google and others, uh, and they came after this guy, Maria uh, Mario Gonzalez. Um, he's a lawyer, uh, getting lawyers a bad name, I would argue, uh, that he was supposed to almost foreclosed closed in 98. Um, he sued Google in 2012, saying, hey, I don't want um, the world to know that my home is foreclosed on. It's kind of it's bad for my business as a lawyer. I want Google to scrub any, uh, any indication that I was foreclosed on from Google's servers. That's the right to be forgotten. And in 2014, the EU Court of Justice said, yeah, I think that's a good idea. We should not be held to forevermore for what we did. You know, there should be essentially, a, in the olden days, before the internet, uh, there was a time when you, people just forgot about stuff. So that right to be forgotten is something the EU wanted to write into law. So under the EU Court of Justice uh, system, the person says, hey, I want to be forgotten. So the search engine, like Google, would delink the name from that particular, uh, those particular results. Uh, this has been done in history, right? This is, this is not something that is new to be able to change the past or at least erase the past of what was, uh, may have been before. 
Um, so uh, Google initially said, okay, I'll do that. Okay, it's an EU law, so I'll do that for you know, .uk, .fr, right? It's EU centric. Um, I'm not going to do it for Google.com because I, as a US person, should know that Mario Gonzalez filed for, uh, filed for closure, first thing. But then a French court said, no, actually, you have to do Google.com too. So in 2015, they ordered uh, Google to fight globally, and they said, you know, you'll get uh, between one and two and a half billion dollars in fines if you don't do this globally. Uh, so Google said, uh, all right, I guess I'll do it. So they complied for everybody, um, and they often use geolocation signals like IP addresses and otherwise to be able to limit um, things to their home country to the extent they can. Uh, to the extent they can't, uh, you can't find Mario Gonzalez's home for Google. Uh, in the last year, which is why I'm talking about it now, the, there are two cases which are indicative of the right to be forgotten. Uh, thing, person number one uh, is a conspiracy. Uh, they, in the late 90s, this is essentially white collar crime. He was doing bad things. Um, he was jailed for four years, and he was misleading the court. He was a bad, bad dude and showed no remorse at all. Person number one. Person number two, in con he was pretty much the same crime. So it was conspiracy, business, white collar crime. Um, it was ten, 10 years ago, jailed for six months, and he was totally sorry, the judge said. So uh, both of them filed the right to be forgotten that of their respective court cases. Um, and the EU said, nope, person number one, you weren't remorseful. You uh, cannot be forgotten. You're, uh, the data of you being arrested and convicted of this thing is now, uh, is now on for your permanent record, as the grade school teachers used to say. Um, but the person number two, who was totally remorseful, uh, got to be the right, right to be forgotten. So I guess this demonstrates um, how it is uh, subjective, not an objective thing. As to whether one can be forgotten or not, and I guess it raises questions in my mind and maybe yours as to what extent can one really be forgotten? Once something is put on the internet, to what extent can it be or should it be taken off? And that's a big philosophical question that everybody's thinking about. How does like public domain and public record come into play? I mean, we, we have access in perpetuity for like all case court case records, right? I mean, mm -hmm. How how is this different? as far as like, being exposed to the public? The, the biggest difference is, of course, they, that's, uh, we're in the US and they're in the EU. So to the extent they're US court records, US things like that, of course, the US does not have a right to be forgotten. Even though some people have proposed that, we, hey, we should do like the EU does, and we should also have a right to be forgotten. So far, I haven't seen that getting any traction. And there's a lot of uh, First Amendment uh, issues uh, to that, you know, right to no knowledge. Uh, and uh, our public records laws are arguably um, stronger. So um, I would say that to the extent your court records are EU court records, and you have an EU citizen wanting to get rid of those, then uh, it may be a deal. But to the extent it's uh, domestically based, at least it's not there yet. Is this right just for the past, or can I do this prospectively as well? Ah, <laughs> so if I come out of the crime next year, <laughs> to keep, it, keep it out of the news, um, I, it, is, it is just re uh, pr respectively, not prospectively. That's a really good question. So the, the question is largely, can you have uh, security by obscurity, right? So the, the, we have court records to, in the past, but you have to go down to the courthouse to actually find them. So really, by all practical measures, you don't find them, even though it's publicly accessible. So um, I don't know the answer as to whether the EU's court records are publicly accessible, so you can find Mario Gonzalez's uh, foreclosure or these two people's um, arrests. I presume the answer is yes, that you would be able to. But they just don't. Um, the whole purpose of this right to be forgotten is if I apply for a job, um, and you know, put somebody's doing a, a quick internet search. They're not going to run down to every courthouse to be able to find out if I got arrested. But it's so easy to find on the internet. So I think that um, the answer, I, I don't know the answer to that. I would guess the answer is no, that they would not seal off the court records, but, they, but instead they just seal off the low hanging fruit, which so is the internet. Person could still go through the I, I don't know the answer to it. I'm, I'm guessing yes, uh, but that's a, that's a pure guess. And I, I should actually have started this out by, uh, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer, so none of this is legal. <laughs> uh, so uh, so I, I should say yes. Yeah. So I've not done that research to find out what the answer to that question, but uh, it's, a, it's a good question to ask. Uh, so as part of this, Google's been doing a bunch of these right to be forgotten cases. So they have a transparency report saying this is how many right to be forgotten cases we've done. Uh, there are two and a half million URLs that people have said to, asked to be delisted, largely related to professional information, uh, it also talks about um, you know, the types of uh, websites that have been uh, taken off and who's doing it. It's almost all private individuals, as you can imagine. Um, some are minors, uh, almost half. Um, 
so that's uh, that's right to be forgotten. Uh, here's here's another case closer to home in South Dakota, and I was building the slide. And uh, for those of you who present, you might enjoy this. Um, I initially wrote the slide like this, and and you might have seen slides like this. And this slide sucks. And I thought, how how the hell is somebody in this really fast thing going to be able to find all that? And I thought, well, maybe to do coloring, right? This is all about. It's a sexy case, literally a sexy case, where two people were um, having an affair on their spouses, and then one of the spouses found out about them, and then started disclosing the the affair. That doesn't reflect the sexiness. And I thought, okay, maybe I'd do it like this. And so <laughs> pictures are always better than words. So I thought, okay, uh, those two people, those two people are married, and those two people are married. They, uh, so these people are, um, it's corresponding with each other about the affair. Um, and then the husband gets the, that and kicks it to the wife, right? That's not cool. Um, and then not only does that, but then the husband sends it to the kids. Also sucks. Um, so the big question is, does the wife that, that was cheated upon have an expectation of privacy to not have her kids know about her husband who's having an affair with the other guy. Um, and the US, South Dakota Supreme Court, I think, is, so yeah, South Dakota Supreme Court said, no, you don't, you as the, essentially the cheated upon spouse do not have an expectation of privacy about your cheater spouse's dalliances, is the idea. That's a hell of a lot more interesting than that, right? <laughs> so, so if you think about, you know, whenever you think about how do I make how do I make a, a presentation a little better, and I, I, I like to think about presentations like kind of good. Don't do that. Do do it more like this. <laughs> uh, revenge porn. I thought of, uh, maybe I could do a, a. That's the best graphic I could find for revenge porn. As you can imagine. Do not uh, use DuckDuckGo and certainly use uh, VPN if you're going to be searching for revenge porn. Um, uh, so that's uh, that's revenge porn. There's, uh, there's cases uh, all over the the country because uh, states have found revenge porn created revenge porn laws. And California is, of course, the leader in this. Uh, there's a five, over a $5 million judgment against somebody who provided revenge porn. Um, and uh, essentially, they uh, posted explicit photos of a woman uh, in that $6.5 million where um, he impersonated the women on dating sites and uh, said that uh, I should make you want to kill yourself. Uh, you can imagine that's why the number is bigger for that second. Uh, Minnesota does have a revenge porn law, uh, and it's, uh, if you intentionally disseminate a private sexual image of another person, uh, and it doesn't require you to know for certain that the person whose photo it is um, would not like it to go out. That's kind of a complex sentence. So the, the extent is, is that I, um, I, if I take a picture of her, um, I don't have to know that she would not want that to go out in the world. Um, it's, it's regardless of my knowledge of whether she would want it out in the world or not, um, it is a violation of the statute. Uh, and penalties are less than a year or less than $1,000. Uh, there is a big question as to whether it's constitutional, whether it's too broadly <laughs> written. Uh, what if somebody, uh, what if she did want that put out in the world or not? Or what if, uh, what if there's, um, you know, so maybe an oral indication? Uh, it's the wrong term. What if there's a, uh, <laughs> what, if, what, if, what if she said, what if she spoke that she wanted to, but it's not necessarily right? Uh, anonymity uh, is a big deal. Stingray, uh, people might have heard about stingrays. Essentially, it's a man in the middle attack in cybersecurity terms where you have a van uh, that uh, your phone thinks is a cell tower, but the van is actually talking to the cell tower. So it's, a, it's all the data that you're speaking, when you think you're speaking to the cell tower, it's actually flowing through the van uh, through a device called the Stingray <coughs> that the law enforcement, whether it's federal or state, is actually going through. So through this, they can get a whole bunch of metadata, uh, like who you're calling, uh, what your phone number is, um, SMS, voice calls, data, to the extent it's not encrypted. Um, so they're able to do a lot of these things. Uh, some, case, uh, some courts have said that to be able, much like the um, uh, the Supreme Court case where it says you need to have a warrant for these things. Um, similarly said, if you are using a stingray, uh, you, you need to have a warrant for who you're catching. Because that's a big, pretty wide net that you're pulling people in uh, to be able to push through. So the Southern District of New York said, yeah, you need to, uh, uh, it's warrantless, it's Fourth Amendment uh, violation if you don't use a warrant. Uh, DC Court of Appeals also just said a similar thing. Uh, there's a switch to privacy when you're using the phone. You don't realize that you're being surveilled. Um, so there is also a fourth. And then just in the last year, which is why it's on the slide, uh, Northern District of California also threw out evidence that was a warrantless search for a stinger. All right, that's a lot of privacy. Uh, these are going to go. The next one's going to go fast. Security. Uh, apparently, the uh, Trump administration wants to do things offensively on security. It's not of this defensive stuff. We're going to we're going to build uh, cyber offensive. Uh, Russia took over, uh, or at least had the ability to take over a bunch of uh, not just cyber uh, data, but also uh, physical devices. Uh, so they used Triton to be able to. Uh, use controllers to affect uh, manufacturing facilities. Uh, Minnesota, right here in River City, Department of Human Services had 21,000 patient rec records that went away because they were hacked. Um, they found out uh, it was compromised in June, uh, uh, second in July, and they found out about it in August. Uh, so that, that's not uncommon. Uh, you know, they, they say that often attackers are within uh, within uh, a system for almost a year uh, on average before they're, they're discovered. 
Blue Cross, uh, yeah, 16,000 patients, uh, lots of other breaches, so those are just a highlight. Uh, if you want others, I can give you the stuff. Uh, including uh, law firms, there's a lot of, uh, you know, those might, you might work in cybersecurity, uh, law firm, uh, regular Fortune 500 companies, like the one that we're in here, have battened down the hatches pretty well. Law firms don't batten down the hatches as well, so the, cyber, the attackers think, well, okay, do I do I go after the Fortune 500 company, or do I go after the law firm, and uh, they're tending to go over to after the law firm for them. Lots of them were hacked, I, I won't go into them now. Uh, this, is, this is kind of an interesting hack, where uh, I'm an attacker, I want to steal your, um, your stuff, and you, I know you have 2FA, so I call your carrier and I say, hey, I've changed cell phones, why don't you switch to this cell phone number? Um, carrier does that, and then I sign into the thing, because uh, I have your credentials, and then the 2FA comes to my phone instead of your phone. Um, that's a uh, hijacking of uh, that. So that's the reason that uh, 2FA, uh, the two-factor authentication, generally SMS is deprecated. That's no longer really a best practice because it's easily, so easily. Um, so if you are a T-Mobile or a Verizon or something like that, most of them have been completed a way that you as a you, uh, customer, and, uh, like I as a customer of uh, T-Mobile, called up T-Mobile and said, hey, uh, here's my PIN, so if anybody asks for, uh, for a change of phone number, they would, uh, the attacker would be able to hijack because they don't have my PIN. So essentially that's the third factor, uh, the, my PIN, that uh, helps the second factor, which is the cell phone. <coughs> All right, so that was fast, right? Internet. Uh, physical nexus requirement, this is where uh, everybody shopped on Amazon because you didn't have to pay sales tax. Uh, those days uh, went away from a business perspective because Amazon started doing it because they knew that something like this was coming down the pipe. There's an old case out of South Dakota called Quill that said you had, uh, back in the olden days, you had to have physical presence in the state to be able to collect sales tax there or to have to collect sales tax there. Uh, but this new case, Wayfair said, actually, you don't need to be physically there. Uh, Amazon, even if they don't have a presence in Wyoming, uh, they still have to collect sales tax in Wyoming. People probably know net neutrality, so I'll go through quickly. Uh, this, uh, largely, the FCC said uh, they were not uh, regulating as much uh, the cable companies, and so then they did a bunch of real uh, rulemaking saying, hey, maybe we should regulate them more um, to be able to avoid things like this. So this is essentially, over time, uh, Netflix's speed on Comcast. So the dark line is uh, right before, right here, right there. Uh, that's during the negotiations with Comcast as to whether uh, they're going to renew their agreement with Netflix. And as soon as they reach the agreement, then it goes back up. So this is a kind of a real world example of what could prospectively happen if net, net neutrality is not enforced. So they slowed down until they reached an agreement. Um, so uh, they classified the, them as a Title II utility, much like a, any other utility, and said you can't throttle block or pay prioritization. Um, and then they sued, and the court said, no, nope, the FCC was fine. It said uh, you can regulate it as a, as a utility. And then this happened. <laughs> and he appointed that guy, and that guy uh, was also on the FCC, but he was in the minority as a Republican uh, under the previous administration, but then as when the Republicans got the majority, he got the chairmanship. And so when he got the chairmanship, he said, even before he became the chair, he said, you know, I'm going to fire up the weed whacker on these regulations. I'm going to let businesses just do business without all these regulations, which included net neutrality um, is the idea. So he got his big mug, and he uh, repealed net neutrality in June of 2018. And here's a study showing uh, before and after that agreement and how much they've been throttling uh, YouTube, Netflix, and otherwise. And there's kind of speculation in the industry that um, the uh, service providers are not yet throttling because they, they don't want to be seen as you know, the kind of dipping a toe in the throttling waters, if you will, uh, to be able to see whether it's going to be uh, going or not. But you can see Verizon, that's a lot of, uh, lot of throttling uh, on the Verizon side. And not coincidentally, uh, he was actually worked for, uh, as a lawyer for Verizon from 2001 to 2003. So a bunch of people sued, uh, state sued, including the state of Minnesota. Uh, so uh, under Lori Swanson previously, now Keith Ellison continues the lawsuit, um, suing under state law, uh, saying that we can regulate within the state, whether uh, we can say, uh, you know, it's fine if there's not a federal law saying you can't throttle or anything like that. But we as a state say, if you're going to do business in here, we have the right as a state to be able to say you can't throttle. Um, so that is, uh, of course, being vigorously defended because the, um, and here's all the cases around the country where those, those states have said that they should be able to do such things. Um, Agit Pai said that the California law is illegal, saying essentially there's things in uh, the courts called federalism, uh, at least our government called federalism, that if the feds and the state try to regulate the same thing, generally the, the feds trump the state, if they, there's kind of overlap. That's the idea of federalism. So Agit Pai is saying, hey, there's federalism in play because the feds, states stay out of this because the feds got it. Um, and one of them is the wildfires, uh, is the big example that um, one of the large uh, telecommunications companies was alleged to have uh, throttled uh, 
uh, firefighters during the wildfires so that they, they weren't able to get the data they needed, which maybe put lives at danger. So that's kind of been a rallying cry for the net neutrality folks. So uh, Congress, uh, now with the, the House having the Democrats, are trying to say, well, the FCC is a, a ostensibly an agency that we as Congress have given the right to be able to make these decisions or not. How about we as Congress decided ourselves and bypass the FCC altogether and say written federal law uh, and statutorily, this is the way it needs to be, net neutrality is the law of the land. Um, that's not really going uh, really far, especially since the Senate is a majority Republican. Who knows what's going to happen? This is kind of interesting, a, a seizure-inducing tweet. This is a, this is a life is uh, stranger than fiction, where uh, this, uh, there's a, a journalist out of Texas named Ari Goldstein, uh, who uh, apparently raised the ire of this guy out of Massachusetts. And so the guy out of Massachusetts created this fake Twitter account called Ari, a bunch of uh, you know, open and closed friends, Ari Goldstein, uh, with the, it's the at Jew Goldstein is the at. Um, he sent a message to the real Ari Goldstein um, saying you deserve a seizure for your posts. Uh, it turns out that Ari uh, Goldstein, the real one, um, has epilepsy. And so he, upon receiving this, got an eight-minute seizure um, on receiving this tweet. And the defendant in his DMs uh, spun up to discovery say, I know that the real Ari Goldstein has epilepsy. I hope he sends him a seizure. Let's see if he dies. That's his DMs uh, in the record. So uh, that's the Massachusetts guy who sent the tweets. And the court said, uh, and there's a criminal law and there's state law, or civil law, rather, criminal and, and civil. Uh, and so this is on the civil side. And if you do something bad, if I, if I punch you in the face, I can get taken to jail for it. And I can also have to pay you on the civil side a bunch of money for what's called a tort, right? Punching somebody in the face. So the question is, is this a tort? Is this like punching somebody in the face, sending somebody a tweet? Um, he was arguing on his defense, hey, this is just like me saying, you're a bad person, right? That's a First Amendment, my First Amendment right, that I was sending a tweet, I was essentially sending data, communication, you can't help me uh, either criminally or civilly liable for something that is essentially words. Um, and the court said, no, that's actually not words. It says, you know, you wanted to cause this guy a seizure. He says, you know, that's outside of the bounds of civil society, uh, it should be punished and it's compensable. And the idea under the court's reasoning, which seems reasonable, is that this is a strobe gift, right? This is a flashing thing. Um, it wouldn't have mattered if that strobe gift had hateful words or loving words. If, the, if it said, I love you very much, right? Uh, that would still cause a seizure. So the, the point is not the words that would fall under the First Amendment, but is instead the effect that the words had, not even the, the graphic had, on the creating seizures. So the idea is that you know, it could even be abstractions, right? So it's, it's content neutral, so the First Amendment doesn't apply. Therefore, it, you can be held both civilly and criminal by It's kind of an interesting case. Uh, Prenda Paul Hansmeyer was a, a graduate of the University of Minnesota Law School. Uh, one of some of my friends have uh, graduated with him. He created a, a Prenda law firm. Uh, and what's a, been alleged, at least, is that he, uh, he and his firm, I, I take it back, his firm bought a whole bunch of pornography uh, films, uh, put them up on the internet, uh, saw that they got downloaded, um, then sued the, the John Doe lawsuits, and then as part of the lawsuit uh, for copyright infringement, they asked for John Doe's uh, IP addresses. They went to the Comcast of the world and said, give me the IP addresses, got the IP addresses, then they were able to find the physical addresses, and then sent a letter to the person that downloaded saying, hey, uh, we're gonna sue you and name you in this lawsuit unless you pay us $3,000 or whatever the number is. Um, so this is a pretty, pretty decent, uh, pretty decent uh, money until um, they were charged with wire fraud and money laundering and other, other things uh, for creating this pornography honeypot. And now they're facing about 10 years. Blockchain solves everything, right? Uh, you know, block, you know, some might say it's a database, you know, but, but it's, it's really, it's, it's doing everything. But this is a, kind of an interesting blockchain application, I thought. So this is a, it related to the law. Uh, consent is a real thing, right, uh, in, in the sexual relationships. So this uh, Sweden has a, a, in the blockchain where if uh, I'm not going to say I, but if this guy in the picture asks uh, this other uh, person to have sex, um, the consent of that sex is stored in the blockchain. And of course, one of the benefits of blockchain is it's ostensibly immutable, right? So then, if that person changes their mind later on, uh, they wouldn't. Uh, they wouldn't. Uh, you can look to the blockchain and say, you know, the evidence shows that this uh, this consent was given. Therefore, anyway, so that's kind of an interesting. Uh, uh, we, we thought that uh, there are some, some physical things that remained out of the blockchain, but now uh, apparently lots of things are. How is this blockchain different than uh, recording a person? That's, that's true. Uh, so the, the, the question is, how is blockchain different than taking, a, say, a video recording or getting an email? And really, it's, uh, in, in evidentiary terms, it's all a spectrum. It's it, what is most uh, believable, right? So if, if I got an email from the person, that'd be on this side of the spectrum. Or let's go, this side of the spectrum is she said it without any recording. 
I got an email from the person. I got a photo of the person. I got a, a video of the person saying that. Uh, I got it on blockchain. Because blockchain, you can't do a deep fake of, right? So it's just a matter of the, the uh, reliability and believability of that evidence. How do you think this would interact with the rights be forgotten? Oh, it's a really good question. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So that's, I, I love that question because, because largely, so this service provider, they get a right to be forgotten, um, will query whether that consent would be publicly available, right? So that service provider is probably not going to make it publicly accessible. But if they were to, which would be a dumb business move, right? I can't imagine that. <laughs> that would be, but if they were to, and then they got an a, a EU right to be forgotten request, arguably they would have to delete it from the blockchain, which is maybe hard or maybe impossible because it's a ledger that's up there. It's a really good question. Um, I doubt that it will come, come out to play in this situation, but I, I'm guessing that maybe it will come out. Well, maybe. But, but my guess is that this company is not going to make the block, you know, Bitcoin, for example, the ledger is publicly accessible. I would, get this is a, I would guess this is a private blockchain uh, so that only the employees of the company would be able to see the thing. And, and, and respond to subpoenas, they would not be publicly accessible. Will this assume the presumption? Is the presumption of innocence involved here, or if a person like we're talking about the cell group, and so? Well, in this case, this, this, uh, the person who would be incriminating themselves would be the uh, victim, not the perpetrator. So this would not be a, 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 a perpetra alleged perpetrator uh, incriminating themselves, but it would be a victim showing that the, the person did not make, commit a crime. It's, it's on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, accessibility is a big deal that might be uh, for you devs out there. And the question is as to whether an, a website has to be ADA compliant or not. Are they, uh, uh, are they like this space where if it's built after 1990, whatever, um, it has to be uh, wheelchair accessible? Is a website like that where they have to be accessible to the blind, to the uh, hard of hearing or otherwise? Uh, the Department of Justice has been promising guidance on this for many years. Um, but they uh, said, yeah, actually, we're going to punt it. We're not actually, not actually going to decide it. So instead, the courts are kind of muddling their way through. And as I said earlier, lawyers and judges generally aren't as tech savvy as other folks are. So um, there's a whole bunch of cases that come down on both sides. Either the website is accessible, it needs to be accessible, or the website doesn't need to be accessible, depending on your jurisdiction, depending on the type of accommodation, all these things. And it's just a mess, uh, so which is you know, a mess legally means lawyers to have a lot of work, unfortunately. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's a way that uh, the DOJ could um, provide some stability, but they haven't yet. Social media. Uh, there's a cer uh, certiorari for uh, the Supreme Court asking whether a private op operator can be a state actor. And this is, this is a um, community, ser community access uh, television uh, where they um, are asked to, be, uh, to hold the television community access provider liable for one of uh, their contributors' um, bad things that they get. Like, so essentially, should the community access be held liable for one of their users? Which, of course, um, there's analogies there, right? Should a platform be liable for the users in there? So there's a big question as to A, whether cert would be granted, and B, how the Supreme Court would fall out uh, in light of the platforms. Uh, federal law that was passed, uh, they do pass laws periodically. One of them is uh, talking about negative reviews on Yelp or otherwise. Um, under the new law, uh, if a company tried to contract with their customers saying, don't review me, otherwise you're going to pay X number of dollars, or don't review me, or X will happen. Um, under the new law, that, that's not permitted. Uh, similarly, if you say, um, don't post or I'll do a penalty, uh, that's another thing. Uh, the first and only case, uh, as far as I know, was uh, actually right here in River City in the District of Minnesota. Uh, and they're actually doing all sorts of bad things. And so um, a lawsuit and uh, things are generally you throw the kitchen sink. And this is just one of the little things as part of the kitchen sink um, that had to do with uh, disclaimers in them. Uh, uh, asking their customers to not talk about it. Uh, this is a get rich quick scheme uh, here in Minnesota, and that's the disclaimer that they actually showed at one of their uh, speaking crap slides. That's, that's a horrible slide. Uh, and Lori Swanson prosecuted under the, that act. Uh, you can get into SEC trouble by tweet. Uh, you've probably heard about this. Uh, if you want to talk about taking it private for 420, uh, uh, to sell 420, and uh, 420, of course, uh, that's uh, whether he was holding or not is another question. Uh, but it, uh, it sunk the shares, and he got in a lot of trouble, including having to uh, do some board uh, shifting. A Texas judge fired his assistant on the right, so the judge is on the left, the assistant's on the right, um, for, for posting things about politics on Facebook. Fired her. There's a big question. This is one of many, many cases where can, uh, can any employer uh, fire their personal employee for speaking what's essentially on their personal behalf? Um, so that's a, a case that uh, is unfortunately all too common. 
their things. Uh, self-driving cars are here. Uh, at least some, there's a spectrum, right? There's zero to sell fully manual to five fully autonomous. Um, so in 2016, the feds are essentially saying, go ahead and go forward. Uh, manufacturers get those roads, uh, those autonomous cars on the road as soon as possible because they see it as a safety uh, thing. Because um, generally, uh, we've made our cars safer. It used to be that uh, there was a third of the cause of accidents was the road, a third was the car, and a third was humans. It was kind of a, a Venn diagram as to what combination of those. Now 94 or 95 percent is human based. We've made the cars safer, we've made the road safer, we've not made the humans safer. So the feds are saying, hey, get those on the roads because we want to save people the longer we wait, the more, uh, more time, more people will die, essentially, as a result. Um, so they released Plan Triple in 2017. And of course, that was uh, right before uh, uh, 2018, which is when Trump came in. Uh, Trump uh, largely uh, created 3.0 the following year, uh, which largely did the same thing as a 2.0. So they keep saying, go ahead, go out there, do good work. Um, Congress tried to uh, create a self-drive act, uh, but it's not yet passed it. But uh, essentially, it would say that uh, there's certain safety rules that are not done by the National Highway and Traffic Safety Administration. Uh, it's a federal agency. But it would say be Congress actually enacting it instead of the agency. Privacy is a part of that. Um, do you want your government or do you want civil litigants to be able to see where you're driving and how you're driving um, all the time? And you know that kind of is a, that concern is a bit misplaced because we already have surveillance devices in our pockets all the time. Query how much different uh, the car would be. But uh, pass the House is not yet passed the Senate. And uh, National Highway and Traffic Safety Administrator, uh, we, we, a few years into this administration, still have an administrator, which would be the one that would ostensibly be cheerleading and trying to pursue things. Uh, right here in River City, the department uh, the, in Minnesota, I was uh, uh, happy that the governor appointed me to be part of the task force, or at least I was one of them talk about data privacy and data security, talking about to what extent does Minnesota automate or, or regulate or not regulate autonomous vehicles within our, uh, within our state. So we had a task force that uh, was uh, finished its work in December of last year uh, talking about the, looking at this from a bunch of different angles and uh, Governor Walls has now uh, just announced a new task force for anyone who's interested in being part of that task force. You can put your name in the ring to be able to be part of that conversation to be able to see to what extent if states are regulating and again you have this federalism thing. Do the feds trump the states? I use the wrong word. Do the feds uh, triumph over the states, I guess is another way to say it. Um, do the, uh, in, you know, the feds saying this is fine, can Minnesota say, no, actually it's not fine. You can't do these things. That's kind of a push and pull that these uh, are going to be going through. Uh, Self-driving cars, we're currently at level four, and if you believe Elon Musk from Monday, if any, anybody saw that video or that announcement, um, he's apparently got capable hardware of doing it today. It's just a matter of getting regular approval, going all the way to level five for a lot of uh, there's a lot of pilot programs, including one going from California to Florida. Uh, California passed a law explicitly saying that you can drive driverless cars in there. Query whether other states, perhaps in Minnesota, might be able to do the same thing. And you know, people, as they see <coughs> friends with Teslas that are doing the things, right, and they see their own cars maybe doing uh, lane changes and maybe alerting them of them swerving into the lane, they're becoming more trusting of this. And there are surveys showing that. Um, that uh, 6 to 10 still say they'd be afraid, but that number is getting lower and lower as you go forward. This guy, I was stopped uh, drunk on the side of the road in California, and he's like, hey man, uh, this is on autopilot, so I did, I could be drunk, it's okay. Uh, not a good idea. It's <laughs> kind of an interesting uh, thing that uh, this, uh, this is, of course, a, a, a fun party favor, but it's also a listening device. So it's, uh, ostensibly, it's, it's waiting to hear the wake word, so in this case, Alexa. Um, and then it'll start storing uh, up to 60 seconds on the machine, but of course, um, it may push a lot of things up to Amazon and cloud and otherwise. So that, as you can imagine, is kind of uh, interesting to law enforcement, where in this Arkansas case, uh, some dudes were hanging out in a hot tub, as a couple of dudes do, and then one guy ended up being dead uh, the next morning. Uh, there was an Amazon, there was an Alexa, as, as happens. Uh, the Alexa was in the room, the law enforcement said, hey, Amazon, give me the Alexa data, because there might be a, you know, voice recognition where maybe somebody said, Alexa, how do you bury a body, or something like that. Um, so they subpoenaed Amazon, and Amazon said, no, we're not going to do that. You can imagine that's a bad precedent for Amazon to give over its customers' information to the or and otherwise. Um, the defendant, uh, after some wrangling, the defendant said, all right, Amazon, go ahead and turn it over, and they did. So that was kind of a detente in the Arkansas case that also came up in a different case, New Hampshire, where there's a double murder, um, there's a love triangle between a spouse, uh, two married people, and then a third person, a love triangle. Uh, court found probable cause. So this, in this case, the court actually ordered Amazon to do it. And then Amazon said, uh, we won't release it without a valid and binding legal demand. So the court issued the order in November last year. And uh, 
have not followed up to see exactly, you know, a lot of this is, uh, is not publicly accessible. So, you know, ostensibly Amazon may have actually turned it over. This is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, couples sitting in their kitchen talking about, hey, maybe we should get into kitchen cupboards. And then they get a, a call <laughs> from, uh, from uh, their friend saying, you're being hacked. Shut off your, your Alexa right now. And I said, what, what happened? So t what it turns out happened is that uh, the husband and wife having that conversation uh, said something that sounded like Alexa. Um, and then uh, Alexa apparently said out loud, to whom? Because they thought, Alexa, send a message, is what I thought it said. And then it said, to whom? And then during that conversation, they apparently said something that, sound, something that sounded like their friend's name. And then after that, it was like, yeah, what do you want to say? And then it started recording their conversation. And then after a certain amount of time, it sent that conversation to the friend. So anyway, so, um, so, anyway, so, so Amazon said this is a very rare edge case that uh, doesn't happen very often. Uh, and we fixed it, Amazon said. But query whether these kind of uh, strange things will happen. Uh, so uh, I hope that there's no Alexa in the White House. Uh, that's, that's my uh, music any musicians who are thinking about copyright, the uh, Music Modernization Act is largely to give uh, creators more money in the Spotify world where they get cents on the dollar. Uh, DMCA, you can jailbreak. Uh, people, uh, everybody in this room I should loves DRM, uh, Digital Rights Management, or, or maybe hates it like I do. Uh, but there's a, an exception saying, and generally you cannot break DRM that is encrypted to be able to protect copyright, the law says, the DMCA says. But the law says there are exceptions that the Copyright Office periodically reviews and creates uh, to be able to say you can. Uh, break the DRM to be able to do things. Uh, so they created these exceptions the last year. One of this is phones, another is smart speakers, another is kitchen devices, another is cars. All these things make sense, right? If I want to hack my car, I shouldn't be locked out of here to do that. Uh, farm implementation and farm machinery. And the way this, why farm machinery? Because John Deere apparently tried to lock it down too, and the farmers were like, hey, I want to be able to hack my, my tractor. Uh, so tractors you can hack too. Guy sold a bunch of discs and got 15 months in prison uh, for. Uh, for this and had to pay a half million dollars in restitution. Copyright reform, EU tried to harmonize their law with the US law, ostensibly. Um, and it's, uh, it was passed in 20, uh, March of this year, just a month ago. And it's going to be uh, two years before it gets implemented. But largely, there's a big question as to those who are interested in data analytics and text mining. It's kind of going to be GDPR like. Is, is that can I soak up a whole bunch of publicly available data and do data mining uh, and text mining? Um, of that publicly available data, or is that actually copyrighted? Is that data copyrighted, and, and would I be violating this copyright directive as part of sucking that up? Uh, also, as uh, presentations are a question, um, is it, if I hyperlink to an infringing copyright source, am I the linker also uh, uh, infringing copyright? It's a big question. Um, and th these are all looking for exemptions, and they have not yet been exempted. Uh, you'll have to, it's, it's an ongoing thing, and even today they're still debating it. Uh, there's also a question as to whether there's a tax. If I'm in uh, a linker to this uh, allegedly infringing thing, do I have to pay a fee as a linker um, based on the infringement of the linky? And there's also a question is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we'll get out of that. Uh, the biggest thing, of course, for anybody in the room is that it, it might take care of memes, right? That that image of the game, the game of Thrones is a copyrighted image, right? And HBO owns that copyright. So uh, ostensibly, that meme would be violating copyright under the EU directive because they don't necessarily use fair use as part of their uh, their argument. In the US, of course, that would be um, kind of a, a fair use. One of the ideas is, are you making fun of or otherwise commenting on that thing? Uh, speaking of copyright, one of the biggest proponents uh, of copyright in the last year is Disney, um, also because of that guy and because of that particular uh, work, which was done in the 1920s, uh, Steamboat Lily. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, anybody who's interested in copyright. Uh, Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act is essentially Disney pushing it through to protect Disney uh, the Mickey Mouse from you know, falling out of copyright because he would have ostensibly fallen into the public domain and then people could do all sorts of Mickey Mouse stuff which maybe is scared Disney. So um, over time, the copyright has continually expanded. It's, it's increased and increased. So it used to be 56 years to 75 years to 95 years. Um, and then, uh, so essentially they keep pushing to extend it. And the, uh, the copyright, uh, the uh, constitution says for limited times. Right? You can only do this for limited times. But uh, it was argued after the Sonny Bono Extension Act in 98, it's really perpetual. They just keep extending it. As soon as it comes up for renewal, they, they keep extending and keep extending. So it's really perpetual. It's not limited times. Uh, the guy, um, and it's especially ironic because think of how many Disney movies are built in the public domain, right? So if you think of Snow White and Seven Dwarfs, made in 1930, um, that's pulling from the Grim Fairy Tale, which was done in 1880. So 1930, uh, 1880, that's 50 years. So that's like you and me 
going back 50 years, which would be 1963. So essentially, we can pull from something from 1963, make our own thing, like Disney did with Snow White, and not have to pay a dime. It'd be pretty fun, right? To be able to pull something from 1963, remix it, and not have to pay the piper. So it shows that they made all their money on pulling from the public domain uh, and not having to pay a dime. But now that they control all the stuff, they say, all right, now you, it's not in public domain. We're going to keep it out of the public domain. So anyway, that happened for a long time. And we've lost a bunch of public domain, not just for from Disney, but a bunch of crappy stuff that nobody cares about, right? And we can't even find the owners for it. So anyway, this guy argued before the Supreme Court, Lawrence Lessig, uh, that you can't do this. Uh, it's, it's not right. He lost. The Supreme Court said, no, it's, Congress can do whatever the hell it wants. It's, uh, it's not a uh, violation of the Constitution. So he said, all right, now I need to focus my time on, on money in government, which is you know, Disney lobbying uh, Congress to be able to do this thing. So I'm, that's where he went into. Um, now, Mickey Mouse is expiring. The, the prior law, the Sonny Golden Law, was 98. Uh, 2019, uh, January, uh, anything created in 23 starts going in the public domain. Uh, so everybody thought, oh, okay, Disney's going to do it again. right? They're going to perpetually do it again. Um, but they didn't. <laughs> so Steamboat Willie is actually going to lose protection in 2024, which is kind of fun. Um, but you think, well, hey, why, why would they extend it over all these years? But it stop now. But it turns out that the, at least the theory is, I don't know this for a fact, but the theory is that the lawyers at Disney are like, all right, we could, we could do this fight again under copyright. But there's also a thing called trademark. They're different things, right? And copyright goes away. Um, trademark stays forever. Right? Coke has had their trademark since 1870. Um, so they said, oh, yeah, we'll just let copyright go away. And if anybody does a Mickey Mouse thing, it's going to be a violation of our trademark. And that's good. Which makes all of us in the copyright say, well, why the hell do you keep extending it and keep the public domain out of it for years? Right? It's ridiculous. So anyway, so that's, that's copyright in the last year. Uh, Steamboat Willie is going to go in the public domain, too. Uh, and then Disney set up against, uh, uh, against Michael Jackson and ABC. Uh, Disney owns ABC. So they went over. Uh, the opposing party saying, you guys are overzealous copyright folks, because they got sued. They're on the defense side. That's, that's our. All right, we have one minute left. I'm going to flip through. Uh, <laughs> boing, boing, people might like boing, boing. Somebody put up all the Playboy Playmates, uh, and then they sued, uh, play, uh, Playboy sued uh, boing, boing, for linking to all these things. They didn't actually post it themselves. They just linked to somebody else who did it. And uh, the EFF, which is a great organization you should look into, uh, said thanks to the lawyers of the EF for uh, their imagining claims, uh, for getting rid of the imagining claims from Playboy. Uh, Java is fair use. Uh, they appealed to the uh, Supreme Court, and it's currently being decided whether Oracle's right, that uh, Google's just stealing from them, or whether Google's right, saying, hey, it's in Java. Um, it's, it's functional. It's not copyright. It goes away. Last one I'll end with, and then I'll let you guys go to the next thing. Uh, AI created work. Uh, somebody put a whole bunch of uh, precious work spark in the public domain, by the way, um, and then said, what does, uh, what does a fine piece of art look like? And then outspit what you see on the screen there. So the name of this piece is what you see at the bottom. Is the, uh, the, that's the name of the piece. And so the big question is, who is the author of that work? Is it the coder that did it? Is it the machine learning arts that went into the machine learning system? Do you be able to spit that thing out? Um, or does anybody own that copyrighted work? Is it an art to be copyrighted at all? Uh, big questions, and thank you very much for coming.